data for good 2030, uh, creating sustained capacity to tackle the SDGs will be the topic. Uh, our panelists are Kelly Jin from the city of New York, Tara from New America, Jake from Datakind, and Anoush from UN. Uh, the panel will be moderated by Tariq, uh, who is the Managing Director and Chief Data Scientist at the Rockefeller Center. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a uh, pleasure to be here with, uh, with everyone here and everyone up on the panel. First, a thank you uh, to Bloomberg for hosting us, and a special thank you to Datakind for bringing us together and having this discussion. Uh, my name is Tarek Kokar. I'm the chief data scientist um, at the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, and before I dive in, I'll just let each of the uh, panelists here give a rapid fire intro to themselves, who they are, uh, kind of what they do. They will come back to me. Um, I'll say a few things. I have a round of questions for these guys uh, and then I'd love to open it up to the room and get a bit of a bit of a conversation going so just as a lightning intro in, uh, Anoush tell us a little bit about yourself sure um, hi everyone my name is Anoush I'm uh, I work with at the intersection of technology and social impact for about 10 years now often in, in and around the UN system just last year the UN Secretary General convened a high-level expert commission looking at how do we enhance cooperation in the digital age so I had the good fortune of getting to understand the landscape from a big picture, and before that, I spent a lot of time um, at the UN's first data science um, unit um, about almost 10 years ago now. So, seen seen a lot of changes in the space. Happy to be here. Tara. Hi, I'm Tara McGinnis. Um, I too, shockingly, am at the nexus of data and public problem solving. I work as an advisor for New America. We have a public interest technology effort that is designed to bring data scientists and human-centered designers and um, Swiss Army knife implementers and a wide range of kind of modern skills to hard public problems. I also teach data for implementation to public policy students at Georgetown. Kelly. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Kelly Jin. I serve as the Chief Analytics Officer and Director of the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics here in New York City, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, I really work day to day with a small but nimble team to help agencies make better data driven uh, decision making. We also run uh, the open data program here in the city and really excited to be here. Wonderful. And Jake, many people will know you, but you're camouflaged without your flannel shirt. So <laughs> you might want to. Switching it up, you know, it's 2019, so new year, new me. Uh, but for those who don't know me, I'm uh, Jake Porway, the founder and executive director of Datakind. Uh, and we're a nonprofit that harnesses the power of data science and AI in the service of humanity, uh, mostly through our uh, pro bono technologist program. So uh, many of the people in this room have volunteered to work alongside NGOs and organizations to see how they could better apply data and data science for social good. Um, and I'm very excited about this panel because it connects a little bit to a workshop we did uh, last year, asking folks what were their kind of big visions for data for good in the, in the future. So uh, I'm very excited to be continuing that conversation here. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Jake. Um, so the goal, goal of this discussion, as Jake said, is really to understand how do we build the sustained capacity to use data science in the social sector to achieve the SDGs, um, and really how to make the use of data science the new business as usual um, in our space. So um, like I said, I, I work at the Rockefeller Foundation. If you don't know us, we're a philanthropic foundation here in, here in New York. Um, and we both do and fund uh, data science. And when having this kind of discussion, I'm, I'm often struck by one, being in New York, uh, and two, the kind of the history of the Rockefeller Foundation in this place. So 70 years ago, um, the foundation received a proposal from some researchers at Dartmouth asking questions like, um, can you use machines to model the human brain? Can you teach computers how to think? Um, this, of course, was the proposal for the Dartmouth Summer Conference where the term artificial intelligence um, was founded. So that's a, that's a very useful fact to have in this kind of discussion. Um, 70 years ago, also, something else was, uh, was being developed. It's the, uh, the UN Declaration on Human Rights. Um, and most people, when we think about human rights and AI, you're thinking about um, you know, freedom of, of, uh, of expression, rights against persecution. But the, the article in the UN Declaration I, I think about most in this context is Article 27. Um, does anyone know what Article 27 is off the top of their heads? Well, hopefully you look it up by the, by the end of this. Article 27 is all about um, the right to share in scientific advancement. So I see um, artificial intelligence and data science as part of the global scientific endeavor. And I think if we're living up to the principles of 
universal human rights. We want to be share. Everyone should be sharing in the benefits um, of this sort of scientific progress. So um, I guess turning back to what uh, Claire and Francesco were talking about this morning in their keynotes, the core of uh, using data science for social impact really, for me, starts with um, understanding the problem and sort of uh, understanding one another's language. So if I may, I want to start by turning to Jake and ask you, you know, you've been working in this field for almost a decade now. Um, as personally and as data kind, what have you learned about understanding which problems to tackle and how to tackle them? Yeah, well, um, you know, I'll say when we ran the workshop last year asking folks, you know, what do you see as the, the future of, of data for good? How do we move beyond individual projects? You know, one of the things that a lot of people noted was that it's still really difficult to scope the right problems. Uh, it's difficult for technologists to know what the social challenge is that we should be applying our skills to. It's difficult for social organizations without that technical skill to uh, identify where there might be a good technical challenge. So, uh, you know, when we you know, sort of hear that, we always, I'm sure a lot of the people in this room hear that at the individual level, if you've worked with a lot of organizations and probably heard the, the kind of tropes in data science, right, of like starting with the problem, not the data, uh, making sure that you've got folks that are uh, locally contextual, understand the locally contextual problems as part of the design process. I think those things have really sort of, um, you know, come up and thankfully hear more and more in our space. Uh, so I think one thing that we're, we've been very heartened by seeing is that uh, technologists and folks in the space are moving away from saying, hey, what's the cool thing I could build? To, um, hey, what are the collaborative of community members uh, that we need around the table to help figure out what is the problem to solve? We really like that. Um, but I think one thing that we're, we're really excited about or maybe have, have kind of learned from this is um, we're starting to see this kind of uh, uh, pilotitis for lack of a better word, where there are more and more of these one-off projects. You might be able to scope a project with uh, the Red Cross to predict where fires might occur, but how does that solve the problem of preventable fires writ large? You know, there's a, there's a bigger step to saying um, we could develop an algorithm for an entire space, or even well, maybe not an algorithm, but a, a finding or some resource. And so um, one of the things that we've been focusing on uh, at, at Datakind is uh, trying to drill into issue areas to say, hey, what are the problems sector-wide here that where data science might apply? Uh, in large part to the generous uh, donation and partnership with the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and so just to like elaborate a little bit on this, we've been working in uh, the community health worker space. So a space where um, a num uh, basically it's an intervention where in a lot of places folks don't have access to health care. And so people will volunteer or get paid to be kind of like local health care workers. And so we've done projects with individual community health workers organizations before, followed a lot of the principles that we've heard today, sitting down and defining the problem, understanding the data, um, but now popping up to the next level to instead say, what are the common challenges across six or seven of these organizations, or where are the opportunities that can help others, um, actually takes on much more of a kind of like a collective impact approach. And so, um, you know, I feel like we're just kind of parroting lines from other design uh, groups, but I think, uh, I mean, they, they remain true, which is, Thinking about how to actually organize those communities, uh, not organize, but, but uh, sort of act within those communities that are already doing this work has been really critical. Um, and I think the, uh, I, if I could just sort of like trim this down to like one thing that I'd say to, to that uh, uh, we've learned about this that I think is valuable is really finding the collectives of folks that are already organized around funding and digital interventions around this space. So there are lots of collectives that are working on community health worker changes, trying to make them more digitally effective. Being able to plug in as a technologist there and say, hey, I'm not just willing to help out for you know, one project that I see here, but trying to understand where we could be helpful in this initiative, uh, we found as being uh, incredibly useful in trying to identify how to even start shaping that problem. So I know there's a lot more we could go into there, but I, I'd say to summarize that, it'd be like, find those collectives that are already kind of like motivated where data science might be that last little bit you could knock over. Yeah. Thanks, Jake. And you want to pick up on something you said there. You're referring to technologists almost as though they're a, they're a tribe. <laughs> Um, and one thing you know we've seen the rise of over the last um, couple of couple of years now is the field of sort of pu public interest technology, which I know New America has been closely involved with. So maybe to, to Tara, a question: um, you know, How are you seeing the the kind of role and responsibility technologists are feeling or should feel towards having a social impact? And um, when you think about the kind of organizations that technologists are now working in, are they even set up to use technology for for social impact? So um, thank you. That's that's a that's a good strong two-parter. So on the first on the first piece and public interest technology, which just to say out loud, I think encompasses the world of data scientists and user-centered designers and front-end and back-end engineers. 
And I think, as you heard in, in some of Jake's remarks, the closer you get to really understanding a thorny problem, um, often in the world of 2019, you need all of these forms of um, technologists at the table, alongside community members, alongside um, policymakers, alongside decision makers, um, first and foremost. And so um, inside that space, it's something we've worked at at New America. It has m multiple vectors. You need to expand the number of data scientists who want to, or engineers who want to grow up and end homelessness. You need to create an aspiration for where you could land. Um, and on the flip side, you need to grow organizations that can receive these new skills and engage them at the table. And to your latter question, Tariq, um, there is a wide variance of readiness of the organizations that work towards solving the public good. So we have actually some good examples, organizations that are birthed to do this, uh, data kind. Um, New York City using data to, you know, an architecture that you can say more, <laughs> Kelly, but I think perhaps was the architecture born before the digital era. Same with the UN. And so the, the kind of readiness is very, it's, it's actually much easier, I've found, working with nonprofits that were built in an, for an online world. Some of the most effective, not, not all of them, but generally speaking, kind of like you see in the private sector, those organizations that were birthed with data culture into their organization are better and moving faster. But we need the UN, we need the New York City government, and we need some older um, nonprofits that have been serving the Red Cross is really deeply engaged in thinking about how you evolve, but evolving from a place um, where uh, you've done things for a long time in a certain way. So I think the 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 real opportunity is for tr for some of the organizations in transition, um, but this, it's not necessarily easy. And if you're solving problems differently, it means fundamentally working differently. And so um, I do think sometimes it starts with having a chief data officer and then moving into a culture over time. Wonderful. So Kelly Tara threw a bit of shade at you there, um, <laughs> and the the uh, the, the, no. the, 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 the I'm still I'm still learning some of these American terminology. But, uh, <laughs> that, 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 I, I'm Sound thinking that. Shade. I'm thinking that council shape, but so New, I mean, New York City. Obviously, you're, you're working at the front lines of using data science for, for social impact. Just curious to know, is it? I mean, is it a challenge working um, in this way? And in particular, how do you see the role of like government and policy in particular of making your job easier or harder? Yeah. So a, a, a few a few thoughts for this particular question. I think one thing that um, has been important not just here in the city of new york and in this role i've been there almost about 11 months at this point um, but also something you know tara and i both worked as part of the obama administration at the obama white house um, is that the connection points between data science data analytics to policy making and a lot of what New America and many other organizations are working on um, is really where the rubber meets the road. And, and I think just to bring in some of the elements that uh, Jake was highlighting, um, just doing a one-off project or doing a proof of concept, um, I think a lot about the fact that um, even philanthropy, and I was just a funder before this role, can help to scale a little bit. Government is the ultimate scaler Right? And I think a lot of um, our work within the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics is to take at, at first cut and how do we show what's possible on the ground. Um, I think a lot about how policy uh, decisions or ideas, some of the best ideas actually come from on the ground street level bureaucrats and managers and frontline staff. And I think that's something that um, for those of you who have had the privilege of working at the local government level, um, that's a huge part of the work is actually talking to frontline staff, understanding that there's a ton of data and a ton of information that they themselves may not even be collecting or have access to. And so I like to think oftentimes of what's that pyramid of data on the ground that's happening and how that, that bubbles up. The second point that I, I want to make on, on this particular question is um, I think that working with technologists, working with um, the city of New York or governments at large, there's also this other piece which isn't just analytics. And I think for a lot of you who may not be as familiar with government, um, there are whole performance management and measurement arms. There are whole evaluation arms. Um, there are statisticians and many other folks who 
for decades and decades have worked advancing data and evidence-driven government. And I think a lot about how do we make our work sustainable by collaborating with those groups. So within the city of New York, Moda, we sit adjacent to uh, NYC Opportunity that does a lot of program evaluations across the city. We also sit adjacent to a group called the MMR team, which is the Mayor's Management Report, something that's by law mandated every year that city agencies must report on performance measures. So when I think of analytics and I think of policymaking, I don't just think of it from a data team within a particular organization. I think a lot in terms of who are the other collaborators and who else do we need to, to actually bring to the table um, to advance the policymaking discussions. Wonderful. Okay. Kelly, you're making the job of moderating this extremely easy. So the, <laughs> the, this naturally tees up an issue working at the UN um, collaboration is obviously a huge part of the, the work and often collaborating with governments and civil society to kind of achieve the, the goals you're trying to. Um, I mean, how, how's that going? Where have you seen, where have you seen sort of the bright spots and the success and where are the, where are the challenges? Yeah, a lot of it resonates with everything I just heard. I just sort of nicely going from, you know, state to city to government to global. Um, where I was working last year, the Secretary General convened this expert panel to talk about the importance of cooperation in the digital age. In the digital era, we are all interdependent. That's the bottom line of the findings of this high-level commission and the report that they published last year. And one of the recommendations is that everybody needs to build up their capacity. Everybody needs to lift up their game because when you talk about life in the digital era, whether it's 10 years from now or just right now, Private sector needs to understand how government works. Mm -hmm. Te technologists need to understand how policy making happens. Policy makers need to understand how data analytics works. Um, you know, it's, it's that cross pollination is necessary across the board in order for us to, to solve problems in this era. So I think on the, a couple of things I was observing and wanted to share just from my experience on that panel and also now working into other parts of the UN system. The World Food Program, for instance, is a large humanitarian organization. And for them, digital transformation is critical because it's at scale. They're trying to f feed 90 million hungry people in 80 different countries. So you can't just have a pilot on how do you survey a few people about their food security needs and how much they've had to food feed today. You have to be able to survey millions of people and ask them how much food did you have to do eat today. So that scalability is really a, a, a critical question going forward. Um, but where I've seen some success in areas, I think, now, on the data use front, I think that the UN system over the last 10 or so years has, we've done a lot of awareness raising. We've done, like, had the benefit of sort of the big data hype bubble starting about eight years ago or so, and, and inside the UN system with partners like DataKind, with foundations, we've raised the awareness. I think across the UN system, you'll now find that senior decision makers to new staff understand what data science is and why it's important and are starting to understand the op opportunities with new technologies, AI and beyond. So the awareness raising has happened. I think the next step is sort of the get our house in order. I think one of the two of you said about like, it's not just knowing about it, it's how, how some of the systems, the old school systems for the com organizations that were not born in the digital era, they are you know, the UN is about 70 years old. So it's an old organization. To, to modernize its own systems is the next important thing so that then you can leverage the opportunities, the incredible opportunities that come from data science. So there's a little bit of, we've raised the awareness, now we need to put our heads down and like organize ourselves and make sure our systems are modernized so that we can tap into these amazing opportunities. Um, on the partnership front, I think there's been a lot of great, um, initiatives, a lot of one-off, a lot of ad hoc, a lot of pilots partnering between a, a UN entity and a private sector company or a nonprofit and a UN entity. Slowly, we're starting to see longer term ones. And I think that's also the next step. That's the future. If you can, if you're working in a company, think about finding a nonprofit or a UN agency or a government partner that you can invest in and have a partnership for a longer period of time, not just one project for a two month commitment, but or even a university, frankly, something more than just two months, a little bit longer. I'm seeing models across the UN system now with like data fellows. So a university will say, we can partner with uh, a UN entity for a long period of time so that our students can be part of projects for a longer term rather than just one, one semester engagement because that's 
it sometimes takes a little bit longer. So I think the longer term and modes of partnering to feed sustainability of these partnerships is the next thing. And then I think lastly, I would just say that the other area where we all need to build up our capacities and games game is understanding the the risks as well as the benefits of the data age. I think that there's a lot of literacy starting now with responsible data and data use, and I think we're going to see more and more of that, and we need to see more and more of that. Wonderful. So in, in a minute, I'd love to open up the floor to questions. So please um, have a think about what you'd like to ask. I mean, uh, a question should ideally be in the form of a question, um, and it will be <laughs> great to kind of hear your name, affiliation, and, and a question. So while you're, while you're thinking about that, I'm going to just fire one across the bow to see how, how, our, how our panelists here are thinking. So one thing I've been curious about is how um, you know, the field of data science or the field of, uh, of tech, tech for sort of social impact, um, how the, the, the actual skills and practices of the people working in this field change as a result of hitting up against new problems and as a result of collaborating with, with new people. So if you've been a data scientist working in industry, and now for the first time you're working in a development organization with social scientists, with people with very different backgrounds to you, um, the hope is that both sides will get something out of it, both sides will learn, both sides will grow, and the field sort of advances. I'm curious whether that resonates with you and whether you see that as a, uh, an idea or a principle to, to think about or adopt in your, in your work. And then anyone can have a, have a crack at that, or you can just say I'm, I'm talking mm -hmm. nonsense and you can move on. Uh, Yes, I mean, my answer is yes. I, I think that um, my experience thus far, and was actually just having this conversation over lunch right before this panel, is that um, the, the, the broader question is oftentimes, what are you trying to hire for? What are the skill sets um, that are necessary to work in any of these organizations here represented? Uh, and, and I think that to me, the technologists, the data scientists here in the room while technical skills are incredibly important, I think oftentimes, particularly in government, that our roles have to be as translators. And so I think of really successful managers of project leads as individuals who can not just do the work, um, but also talk about the work um, and talk about um, the, the process of taking a particular project, project scoping. Uh, and, and moving that from an idea genesis, a seed of an idea in collaboration with um, many, many folks in the outside world. And I think this is a distinction oftentimes between how government or public sector has to do their work, is that we are beholden here in the city to New Yorkers. Um, there are, our budget is over $90 billion annually here in the city. And so it's really important that when we're doing the work, we talk about what, what are the decision trees and how do we actually make those decisions. And that is so critically important. Um, and the ability to, to be at the table, to be in the room, um, to have these conversations um, is always something that I'm looking for when technologists are at the table. Like that capacity to learn, that capacity to have a dialogue. And I think a lot of our additional work, I would say even in the last year has been um, when you're sitting down and you're talking to members of the public, like, and I wouldn't even say this particular room, but like everybody out there, you know, on the sidewalks walking around, how do we explain what we do? And, and how do we define and translate a lot of the technical jargon pieces um, for everyone is, is really, really important um, because I think when you talk about your work, um, it is oftentimes incredibly technical and uh, you have different, almost outer rings of understanding of that work. And certainly, I think for those of us who've had to translate uh, within a government context, like, the, like you're going up different chains and then ultimately saying, what are, what's the impact of this particular project? What are we trying to do? What are the methods that we're using? Um, and so I'm always looking for, at the table, um, bringing in folks who can help be really, really effective uh, translators. But. Yeah, I think your I think your thesis is right that it will change the the skill set of a data scientist. The context will change the skill set. I also think back to this question of organizations. Um, ideally, the kind of the data leads and everyone else have new skills by engaging each other more deeply. So you have more fluent, you have more data fluent policy makers and program leaders. I, you know, I think back to the um, I think the one difference between the private sector and kind of the nonprofit public sector 
is the risk the risk structure for data strikes me as dramatically different. So um, in the private sector, most people have actually authorized the taking um, unknowingly, I think, of their data. So it's just almost all gone. You know, in the public sector, um, the barrier, you know, I, I worked on trying to get people signed up for healthcare. And we had a moment where you know, a million, we have a deadline coming up. You can no longer sign up this time this year unless something happens to you. And we've, we have like a million people who have started an application to get healthcare. And I know from the data that the highest, the most likely way to get them to sign up is to send those million people an email back. And I have their email addresses. But the risk factor inside the federal government for sending them an email back, even though it could be life-saving healthcare, it was sort of a non-starter. Um, so, and where I feel like in a private sector s setting, you would have already permissioned away kind of for the very long um, structure. And so the kind of the risk reward to the business model versus the public sector model and the legal barriers on, on doing what seems like simple for the common good things is complicated. Um, but I think that is one place where I think um, the more people you have cycling in and out of these two spaces will raise the practices across the board. First say, I hope we get to hear your answer to this, yeah. Tarek, as, at some point, as someone who's made this path. So when we get to the end, please jump in. Uh, I'll just plus one, absolutely, and of course. Um, Caitlin Augustine, our director of product, who you may have seen speak in the Oceans panel, uh, started as a volunteer, could have gone into industry, ended up joining Datakind, so it's a real you know, useful proof point for us. Um, but he, as director of product, uh, she's seen so many folks come in as volunteers who then have gained the, the skills or understanding to join the social sector and either get hired by nonprofits uh, or we had a chapter leader leave to become a, uh, a data advisor at a foundation to help them understand how to uh, fund. So I think there's no doubt about it that it's like a really fruitful relationship. Um, but the one like point I'd put on it is it, it's not just nice, I think it's requisite. Like five years ago, we used to say a lot about how every field is having its data moment, right? So every field and industry, but also every social field needs to understand data. But obviously, if you look around the world today, uh, also, we're also, every tech company is kind of having its social moment, right? There's a flip side of like, what is our responsibility and how do we get involved? And so I think it's not just kind of like a nice thing to do. I think we also have this critical requirement for tech folks to be engaged with the, the social challenges of our time. And so uh, I'll pick up on the word that Kelly said, translators, or as some folks uh, have said, like bilinguals, I think are so necessary. I know Stefan Verholst is here, he'll be speaking next. And at the Gov Lab, they're uh, working on data collaboratives and data stewards to, to play a lot more of this bilingual and translator role. So yeah, I just think the more we can have folks who can bridge those worlds, the better off the whole world will be. So hop aboard, <laughs> let's do more of that. I, I totally agree. I guess I don't want to repeat everything that's been said. I think you definitely need bridge builders. I've been fortunate to have that type of a role over the last several years, and I find it's invaluable because you have to have these bridge builders. But you also need the individuals on either side to sort of be chameleons. And I think I've seen several data scientists come through, especially at the UN Global Pulse, which is the first data science lab in the system, where data scientists came straight from academia or straight from private sector never worked with a bureaucracy before, but the ones who succeeded were the ones who were able to pick up that organizational anthropologist inside of themselves and, 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 and find that rewarding to figure out not only is it a complex data challenge, but it's a complex organizational challenge. And on the organizational side, when we had our pre-meeting, you mentioned something about how it, I hope in an ideal world, you go from having organizations that have a chief analytics officer or chief digital officer to an organization where everybody has that as part of their job. You don't have someone whose job title is just chief data officer or digital officer. And I think that the organizations also, we need to think about resourcing in the public sector too because it's much easier for a private sector company to hire and retain a pro data scientist or engineer. It's a lot more difficult for a public sector organization to hire and retain and offer benefits and salary that works. So I think we need to think of new models for resourcing um, and retaining. I think DataKind's got a great model by having these partnerships, a standby task forces in a way where there's these chameleon types of data scientists that are like available at the ready to be brought into projects. Maybe in the future, you know, data or digital needs to be like almost tacked on like an overhead cost to any public sector project. It's just you're going to need support in this realm, and maybe that just needs to be baked in. But 
it's a bit challenging, I think, in the public sector. Um, so it's, it's two sides of the coin. Both the data science community or technical communities understand political and social sector, but also social sector needs to figure out how we're going to resource yeah. what we need to excel in the digital age. I mean, I'll just say we're the first to acknowledge that as much as well, I love the work we're doing, if 10 years from now people are relying on volunteerism to solve the world's biggest problems, like something is horribly broken with the system. <laughs> so like, please, we shouldn't be here in 10 years or else something's wrong. Fantastic. So I'd, I'd love to open up the floor to questions. If you can put up your poor, if you have a, have a query, otherwise I'm, I'm just I'm going to keep talking. See, I see one question here, one question there, and one question there. So I want one from each block. So uh, let's take let's take them all three, and then we can respond to them. So question in the form of a question. Tell us who you are and far away. Hi, I'm Shambhavi. I work as a data scientist at Nithio that's working in energy financing in Africa. Yes. My question is more related to inter interoperability of data and yeah. how it can be increased considering while maintaining data privacy. And I think this is valid at city, state, country or even global level. Excellent, thank you. And I saw one question in this column here as well. Hi, I'm Erica, I work at, I'm a data scientist at Civis Analytics. Um, my question is about how sustained capacity requires access, sustained access to data, I think is similar to your question, but um, you know, given that people are becoming more nervous about data collection after companies have used it inappropriately, how do we make sure to improve the relationship between people and their data so that they can trust that providing their data and us using their data will be an overall public good? And then we have Talap over here. Hi, my name is Talib Kulcha. I'm with the World Bank Development Data Group. Uh, so creating sustained capacity in, in the use of data and data science, we know for SDGs you'll have the greatest returns in uh, in low income settings where we need progress improvements the most. So this is really a question for anyone in the panel that wants to pick it up, whether you could uh, just talk about a few examples of meaningful engagement with countries, uh, national statistical systems, um, uh, universities, or domestic research organizations that uh, actually have started a meaningful discussion at the country level and, and start moving the agenda in the right direction. Thanks. Thanks very much. So um, you guys have all grown up, so I'm just going to let you pick a question and, uh, and answer it. So <laughs> I'll start with two. OK. <laughs> These feel related, I'll say. Um, and I want to kick the hard one number three to my other fellow panelists. <laughs> um, so, so the question from Civis that really gets to kind of sustained capacity and um, public trust, I think, in data that's required to allow you to have the access to do the good. Mm. So I'll make three points. One, we have, to, we have to do better about saying how bad the data is in the first place, I think, to some extent. Um, we have to be more honest about it. And so I think if, and that's related to the public trust, because if you sort of, if you suggest it's perfect, um, where it really never is, um, then there's almost a higher risk in, 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 in giving your data over. We have to be transparent about what we collect and what we do with it. And, um, and I mean, in particular, with, with respect to the United States to race, um, this, this is, I think, the greatest opportunity for data will unleash closing the gaps that exist in the United States on race or will exacerbate our existing challenges on race. Um, and I, uh, we did a really interesting project uh, when I was in the Obama administration where we asked people about the government and about their data. And it was it ran counter to what you would think. If people thought that, that you were going to use their data to prevent them from providing you more data later, like once you tell us who you are and where you live, we won't ask you 15 times, and we're going to use that to help you. They were down for that, you know? Um, so clarity about what, you know, good, good, you, you, we're using this for services. We're using this to make it easier to make sure we pick up your trash. We're using this to make sure you get health care so your kids know when it's time to, to um, so, you know, sign up for school services. So I think clarity of, uh, like many other things, when, when you uh, aren't collecting and keeping in permanencia, um, really offer opportunity. But it's very complicated and the barriers are, are high and I have 14,000 live examples of this if you want to talk about what not to do. Um, you can find me, I'm <laughs> orange, well, you know, orange watch, short hair. <laughs> That's number two. Fantastic. I know. Other people can repeat number two. Yeah, I'm, I, I can piggyback off, off that, at least within the city of New York context. So 
Um, I, I think one point I'll um, really, I think, kind of follow on from this is the, one of the other big things that I am reminded of since I returned to local government is folks actually don't understand what the dividers are between right. federal, state, and mm -hmm. local government. Um, and so when I do think of any time we're doing work, it's, it's not just saying what is the city doing, but also helping residents here in New York understand like who exactly is, is using your information. So one of the best examples of this is um, when folks call 311 here in the city, there's an anecdote where a lot of times people call about the subway system here. It's not run by the city of New York. Um, and so you, you need to be directed elsewhere. And I think about our data in terms of, of that flow as well. Um, here in the city, I think something that is becoming increasingly important, um, uh, building off of all of the actual laws and policies and regulations in place protecting your data from HIPAA to FERPA to anything happening at the state and local levels. Um, is that we are also establishing what are the best practice and um, central offices within the city. So we now have a chief privacy officer. We also have a CISO within the, the city who's helping to work on cybersecurity and, and information security. And so I think of not just um, what are we doing in terms of commitments around your data, but all of that is wrapped up in Technically, what are the actual steps to protect and to de-identify and to lower the risks around the sharing of data mm -hmm. as well? Mm -hmm. And I'll say that anytime we do scope a particular project, especially of individuals, academic institutions, even our data scientists have access, like we have very, very long agreements that are spelling out in there what are the appropriate proper business use cases around a particular data set and what's the um, process for retaining and how long do, a, do we retain um, all of that data. Um, so that's just kind of the, the city answer there. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about interoperability, which I think is just a challenge for everyone, <laughs> not just government, right? Like this is something that uh, industries at large, like I can have the same conversation I have um, across city agencies um, with industry partners, you know, how can you say that one equals one equals one, whether you're talking about a building or um, a street tree, we have a former uh, NYC Parks individual here, um, <laughs> and, and other um, critical data sets. And I don't, there's, there's not a really good answer here. I think that there's a lot of top-down approaches and there's a lot of bottoms-up approaches. And I think for me, it comes back down to what are the business use cases where you can bring everyone to the table and say, this is what we're trying to accomplish as a policy objective, or this is what we're trying to accomplish as a project. Um, what all do we need to hash out at the start in order to make that happen and in order to accelerate the work? And I think this, again, to me, goes back to translating. Like If you walk into a budget office and you're like, we need to make data interoperability a thing. Um, that to me is always, how do you make that a few bullet points down? The broader point is how are we providing services better for individuals? Well, hey, guess what? In order to do that, we need to integrate these data sets and we need to set up some standards. So um, I'll say that that's something that we're grappling with constantly at the city. Um, each of our city agencies, because we are a population here of over eight and a half plus million, um, each of our agencies sometimes actually feels like different countries talking to one another, right? Like we as a city are the size of Switzerland. So when we're talking about one agency talking to another, we also need to think about what the, the data and information flow is. I would just say the same about interoperability. I. I, I was on a panel a few years ago with some private sector people and there was a media company that was saying it's very hard, you know, our audience data is in with one department and our advertising data is within another department and I was like, oh, thank goodness it's not just with the public <laughs> sector, it's also in the private sector. But yes, it's a very difficult problem, I think, for everyone. Um, there's few and far between, I think, success cases other than the, the slog of trying to explain and explain and explain why there's value in the UN context, there is one approach, at least in the humanitarian space, 
um, called the HDX. It's the Humanitarian Data Exchange. They're trying, but it's been a slog, many years of trying to convince all of the humanitarian agencies of the UN system that this is a standard we should all use to make our data more interoperable. But maybe it's a matter of showing those shiny use cases or successes to other sectors, but it, is, it remains, I think, a huge challenge. Um, I think I'll try to tackle the question about the country level and then over to you, Jake, for anything tying a bow around all this. Um, I think the country level, the no pressure. No, no pressure. <laughs> the country level capacity question is, is huge. I mean, you work at the World Bank, so I'm sure you've seen different models. I, th I, think, I think there are some countries where there's bright spots, and those countries have probably noticed. So I'm thinking, for instance, of in Indonesia, there's a, a data science lab that was started by the UN system called Pulse Lab Jakarta, and is going to be eventually handed over to the government. And through the last several years of that lab's existence, it's attracted you know, people that were around Indonesia and around the, the region that have expertise in analytics and marketing, but they you know, kind of found this social sector application interesting and came over, or worked in academia and came over. And so now that's a pool of people that have come through the doors of that lab that the government can, can pull in into some more sustainable long-term projects. Um, as well, there's regional efforts. I think there's a conference called Data Science Africa that started a few years back, which was quite a small and academic, just a few universities, and now it's grown to be quite regional and, and with more and more people every year. Um, I know that the, the UN uh, and, and other partners, the Global Partnership on Sustainable Development Data, Claire, who spoke this morning, they run boot camps and workshops in Colombia, and there's, there's a couple of areas in the world that are, I think, when you tap into the data science and the technical communities, but they need to be fostered. There has to be an ecosystem that fosters them, and the hopefully, government can tap in to that ecosystem once it's been cultivated. Definitely not qualified to put a bow on anything. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, plus one the comments about interoperability and the power of use case and starting with the business decision and maybe drive like just an example of that that can help with maybe a finer point of what we could all do to help here. I was recently at a, a group of folks that were trying to figure out how to track disease outbreaks across different countries by sharing data together. So the idea is like the faster, if you can reduce the time to detect an outbreak, you can act faster and save lives. But data systems live within country borders while diseases don't. So it's really important to share data. And to your point, the, the question for them was, well, how, are we, how do we make our data interoperable? So most of the conversation was, which software do we need? Should it be in Google Sheets? Well, I don't like that. It was very tactical in a way that really lost the big picture of what, what was possible. What, could you, what were you trying to solve for and what, what could you do with it? So I'm probably kind of like hyped up on this because I feel very much at DataKind, we often talk about showing the art of the possible. And if a volunteer project isn't going to you know, be the long-term capacity for someone, can it at least show what could get done? Um, so I think that's really important to try to show those use cases to say, hey, could you actually predict when an outbreak would happen faster? If so, here's the systems you need. Um, so just kind of adding a, a concrete example to that point. But where I think we're getting hung up, maybe a piece that's missed in this is, I actually think the word data is like constantly working against us because everyone thinks they know what it means and they're not distinguishing between personal privacy and like machine learning algorithms. And so even there, I think when people ask, what would we make our data interoperable for? They may be grounding it in, a, in what they are aware could happen. So they may be thinking, well, all we need to do is count. Like all we do need to do is count cases. And maybe that's true, but then you're gonna design the system for interoperability around that versus saying, we actually need a predictive model with this level of like quality and frequency of data. It's a totally different system, potentially. So I think that's maybe one thing just to add is, for those translators or bilinguals or people showing the example, like, I, I wish this for the field. Like, if we could just get more specific about, are we trying to you know, just describe the past? Are we doing descriptive stats? Are we trying to predict? Is this really just about a simple automation? I think that would actually add a lot of clarity about what we're trying to do. Fantastic, Jason. I'm going to treat that as your kind of closing comment. The rest of our, our panel, we have like a a minute before sort of scary men with hooks come and yank, us, <laughs> uh, yank us off the stage. But if you if you could share your you know the, the one idea you want to you want to you want people here to leave with when it comes to creating sustained capacity for data science, what what idea do you want to you want to leave with people here? And feel free to. Yeah, I, I can start. Um, it's consider working for government. Um, I think it is. Uh, are, are you hiring, something. by the way, Kelly? Uh, are you, yeah. We are hiring. hiring. I told everyone I was going to plug this uh, uh, at the end. Um, we're always looking for good data scientists. 
Um, and we are also looking for a data analytics manager to actually lead uh, our team, our growing team of data scientists within the city. So please um, check that out online. I will also tweet that after uh, today. Um, but to me, it is so critically important that um, you know, a lot of the work where, and I've, I've, been, uh, I've been a funder, I, I've worked at the federal level, I've worked at the local level, um, each of these are coming at the issue in a very, very different way. And I think to round things out, um, certainly to consider, uh, you know, at least doing a tour of duty in, in government is critically important uh, to help advance this field. Oh. Definitely do what Kelly said. <laughs> I can vouch as a former, broadly speaking, colleague of hers that it would be, it's going to be great. So I hope at least one, two people <laughs> are Kelly's colleagues by this panel next year. Um, I think a little bit about what is the dream state to your question of like, and this gets to the social responsibility. If, if data has really brought us growth in the, you know, data used in a certain way in the private sector has brought us unimaginable growth of certain companies and revolutionized really um, what, a, what a Fortune 500 company must be, what does it look like to have the speed of competition for brains and the next, um, you know, the cutting edge machine learning and things we can't even imagine that are the, on the next um, horizon applied to our hardest problems, whether that's the SDGs. And what would, you know, I think in the private sector, the, the use case is proven. You need, you need data science to, to, to compete, to get ahead. It's fully changed the business model of uh, the world's growing companies. But I don't think we have the ecosystem yet that brings, you know, if we if we went from one percent of the brains and the energy to two to fifteen on, you know, climate change or hunger, um, we we we're not there yet. But what what are the shifts we could take? And so, is it a you know I think is it bringing the problem solvers scoping together? Is it better advertisements to take the take the roles that are um, ending homelessness in New York City or working? I think. You know, I put that charge to this group of tremendous people about what's one step in your organization, in your life, and in your free time that would get you closer to bringing work on data to the things that matter most to the planet. Wonderful. Anish, final word? Uh, so, I guess broader than just the data, but in the tech world, I guess I'd be remiss. The zeitgeist today is moving, like, where if what the beginning of the 2000s or roughly thereabouts, Facebook made it famous to say, move fast and break things. I think we all know that we need to shift a little bit from that. And that what I've heard in the last year or so is sort of move, move deliberately and build things. And I think that's where we need to go. And I think that you do have to take a long view, especially when you're tackling hard problems. It's not a fast solution. It's not going to happen in a sprint. It's not going to happen in a ha hackathon. So I think we all, whether you're in position to partner, if you're a private sector, whether you're in position to bring on a vendor or a consultant, if you're in public sector, you need to give yourself a little bit of time because if, in order to solve these big problems, we do need to move more deliberately and that does mean a little bit more time. Otherwise, we're just gonna break everything. <laughs> Jake has a two-hander. If I'd known I was closing, the only thing I would have added is that we're also hiring for about eight roles at DataCon. <laughs> Jobs including, for everyone. Yes, a chief program officer to lead our global network of data scientists. So if you like doing that, please come aboard. I just need to make sure Carrie, I Carrie, you hiring as well? Uh, yeah. That's actually, yes, yeah. got a sprint, got a sprint on paid leave. <laughs> but more importantly, the first step to climate change might be uh, the job application of, for someone uh, in this couch, <laughs> the threes company of data. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> we can move responsibly and fix things together. That's fantastic. So look, I'd like to thank the audience for your generous time and attention, yeah. and I'd like you to join me in thanking our wonderful panel today. <laughs>